All right. Thanks everyone for joining. My name is Hannah Wendt. I'm one of the co-founders of True Diagnostic and the director of clinical testing. And we have Melissa on this call as well. She's our board certified geneticist here at True Diagnostic. So if you're super curious about the different aging clocks, like which to use and why you've come to the right place. And before I hop into the webinar straight away, I just want you to think about the supplements you take or you give your patients for longevity, increasing health span, increasing lifespan. You know, you can even think internally about the medications you possibly give yourself or your patients for longevity, increasing lifespan and health span as well, like possibly rapamycin, metformin, maybe a GLP-1 or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And I bet that many of you are giving at least one thing to your patients, whether it be advice from even just a lifestyle standpoint. But I wanna ask you, how do you know that it's actually working, right? We, we don't really have any large randomized control trials that are proving out these lifestyle factors, supplements, medications, or even procedural based therapies are actually working to extend lifespan. So that's what we really wanna to talk to you here about today, we want to see an impact in the short term, right? We no longer know that we have to wait 40 years for a longitudinal trial to come out because there are new tools that you're able to do this with, as you know. So that's exactly what Melissa and I will be chatting with you tonight. Um, and remember, each clock tells a unique story about you and your patient's health. In this webinar, we're gonna dive first into um, the true diagnostic algorithms and what we have to offer. So Omic MH, Symphony Age, and Dunedin Pace, how those work, when to use them and what the tools are to actually evaluate them. And then make sure to stay until the end because Melissa is going to be giving an awesome case study uh, using these actual metrics. So first, just a quick overview of True Diagnostic and who we are. Remember, we're a CLIA certified lab located in Lexington, Kentucky. We specialize in epigenetic research and have one of the largest private epigenetic databases in the world. We've worked super hard to collaborate with the absolute best minds in science, like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, the Buck Institute for Aging, Duke, Columbia. Um, and I think it's worth hearing from some of them directly. So some of our most advanced collaborators. This is the best test I've ever taken in my life. This was so cool. Yeah. I don't know if you guys could hear that, but uh, as many of you know, uh, we were on the, the Kardashians uh, probably about, you know, five to six months ago or so. So they're super smart, so scientific, but um, in all seriousness, we're very proud of the, the actual science we've put out with our amazing team and collaborators. So as a provider, though, your goal is to help patients live longer, better lives, right? We know aging is important, um, but why is it important? And if you all have ever heard anyone speak from True Diagnostic, I'm sure you've seen this exact graph. You've heard uh, us talk about this exact topic before, which is aging set number one risk factor for all cause mortality, morbidity, right? It's, it's not new. Um, we know it dwarfs all of the risk factors combined. As you can see in a few examples here, you have heart disease, COVID, cancer, the top three causes of death in the U.S. for 2020. Um, and all of those are being really driven by aging itself when you compare it against any other risk factor. So um, we'll talk about how we actually measure this before we get into the exact epigenetic process that we look at. I just want to simply define chronological versus biological age, right? We're using this as a test to predict the biggest risk factor and then make changes to reduce those risks. So we know our chronological age, right? It's our calendar age. This is linear. It only increases as time goes on. But for the purpose of this webinar, remember biological age is what we're talking about. It's our cellular age. It's that calculation of the tool that life has taken on our body. And it can actually fluctuate, again, based on various lifestyle, environmental, and or medical influences too. So this is what we're really studying, the epigenetic modification called DNA methylation. Um, and what we can actually tell from a single drop of blood that you send us is quite incredible, right? By just looking at these teeny tiny genetic expression levels. Now, there are even studies showing that if you ask someone how much they smoke or um, how much they've even smoked in the past, the result that you get from looking at these methylation markers is more accurate than their, their self-reported smoking status. And then there are even studies showing you what zip code someone is from based on the pollution markers in their area by looking at these little uh, DNA methylation markers too. So we, we 
commonly refer to this as a light bulb or light switch, meaning if you're missing that CH3 group, um, it's unmethylated here, uh, think of that light switch as being turned on, right? You're, you're getting that gene expression, you're going through that central dogma, and same is true of the opposite. So if um, you're methylated, that CH3 group is present, your gene expression is going to be turned off, you're not going through that central dogma, the light switch is turned off, the light bulb isn't shining. Now, um, in the past even six months, we've actually published uh, with Harvard showing that you can even impute over 4,000 biomarkers that we call epigenetic biomarker proxies from this information and data. We even can measure things like triglycerides, HbA1c, fasting glucose, CRP, and other common and uncommon biomarkers. And as you know, to test all of these individual individually, you would need liters of blood and tens of thousands of dollars per patient. So we were able to do this with massive data sets, advanced machine learning, um, and again, able to generate a large, large data set by combining clinical lab values, metabolomic profiles, and proteomic-based profiles. So really, in the end, what we can predict with this DNA methylation testing is only limited by the size of the data set that we actually have and our imagination as well. Um, I want to give even maybe a real-world example real quick. Um, that actually just got published with Yale a couple weeks ago. Um, so think of neurosyphilis. Right now, you as a physician, if you su suspect someone of having neurosyphilis, it's super, super uh, difficult to make that diagnosis. It's usually misdiagnosed for a few years. Then to get that final diagnosis, uh, you must send your patient to the hospital and you're actually going to get uh, lumbar puncture. And that's about $5,000 for the visit. It's super invasive, painful, and there are a ton of complications that can be associated with that procedure. And the alternative is what Cornell actually just published. They have a set of patient's blood that had neurosyphilis, and they can run DNA methylation testing on it and then use machine learning AI to compare the pattern or what we refer to as this epigenetic DNA methylation fingerprint from those mammalian positions against controls who did not have neurosyphilis to find that exact epigenetic mark of neurosyphilis. So of course that can be extrapolated to any other disease, but I just think it's really, really cool that this is being published. These are tests that we can actually use today. Um, and again, we've known for a very long time now that DNA methylation biomarkers have been shown to be prognostic. Um, they've been shown to be prognostic for uh, things like mortality, cancer, CBD, um, since uh, even about 10 years ago or so. We're just getting much, much better at uh, predicting these outcomes. And how do we actually know that we're getting better? Well, that's what I want to cover with you in the first half of this webinar. What are our tools to actually validate these clocks? All right, we're going to go through five different points. And the first point is going to be where we really want to ask ourselves the question, which clocks are the most predictive of death and disease outcomes? This tells us if we can expect the results to have a big impact on health. Now, it's important first to give different generation of clocks. And I'll do this very briefly. I see we actually have um, some Q&A coming in as well. So continue to put Q&A actually in the um, chat, and then uh, we'll address it in the 10 minutes left that we, we have at the end. So if you know anything about um, the epigenetic clocks or their, their history, hopefully you also understand the uh, generations too. So Ever so briefly, uh, the first clocks were created back in 2013, and this was a massive breakthrough in science and research. I wasn't at the conference myself, but I know people who were when Dr. Steve Horvath presented their, his work and showed that these DNA methylation markers can predict chronological age um, with an R correlation value of above you know, 0 0.99, which you just don't hear of in science. Um, and that was super exciting because the predictive capability of the clocks were amazing, right? We know that age is the biggest risk factor for almost every chronic disease and death, and it was immediately clear that these clocks, even the first generation, were much better than chronological age at telling us how a patient was aging, thus their risk for almost every single chronic disease was measurable. But the first generation clocks were there to predict the chronological age of the patient and tested, right? That's the definition. And there's a really big problem with that, right? We don't care about the chronological age of patients. We care about the biochemistry of aging behind why or how that person is aging. So we're able to detect that better through the use of second generation clocks. By definition, we train the DNA methylation patterns to better measurements of aging, right? That's how all second generation clocks are created. There's really popular runs out there historically known as phenoage, trained to 10 different blood-based measurements, grimage, trained to predict 12 protein-based measurements, 
We even have our omic MH, which was trained with over thousands of clinical lab values, metabolites, and proteins, and our Symphony Age, uh, which was trained trained with over uh, 1,200 different individual biomarkers. So these second generation clocks were much better at predicting disease, right? They uh, were able to even more so predict negative health outcomes um, with accelerated aging scores and lower risk of disease with deaccelerated aging scores. So we've defined first generation, we've defined second generation. Your third generation is going to be your classic Dunedin pace clock, right? People are very familiar with this one. This is the only third generation clock, and it was really just created using a longitudinal trial over a 50-year period that's still going on today. So it's unique because they're taking samples from um, people at the exact same time, um, all the way throughout their uh, entire lifespan, all the way from age three, um, they're about age 52 now. So the summary here is we don't want first generation clocks, right? Not in a clinical setting, at least. Now I want to give you examples of how our clocks perform. So we have omic MH, we've created this with Harvard, um, and we need to look at if these algorithms are most predictive of disease, right? We do this with hazard ratios. If the hazard ratio is higher, it means it's more predictive. So if you look at this chart here, you know, if type 2 diabetes has a hazard ratio of 1.2, when looking at omic MH, this means that an increment of one year in the omic MH will increase that risk for type 2 diabetes by 20%. All right, so we can start to predict the future, right? That's the point. These epigenetic clocks are just another biomarker to use, and they're a really good one too. Um, here's another way to look at that. Omic MH is actually able to predict survival at five years with an 89% accuracy rate um, and 10 years within an 87% accuracy rate. Um, these are just your traditional survival prediction curves, again, with a five-year and a 10-year prediction. Um, and chronological age can only predict um, death essentially with a 72% accuracy rate. So again, we know these epigenetic clocks in particular in this example, omic MH is much, much better. So yes, the three clocks we offer here at True Diagnostic, they're going to be published in peer reviewed journals, and they're going to be extremely predictive. Now that leads me to my second point, right? Just think of these clocks like any other biomarker, as I mentioned, we need to predict the future. And we need to also be able to, though, correlate with quality of life outcomes, right? What's going to happen in the future? And this means health span, not just lifespan. Health span meaning how long, um, how healthy we're going to live in this life. Lifespan meaning how long. Um, the Dunedin Pace, that third generation clock, actually does a really great job at this. Um, so I'm going to use it and pick on it as an ex example. Um, you can see basically... This is from the Dunedin Pace publication of Duke and Columbia University. As the rate of aging increases, the performance of all of the participants in this particular cohort decreases in these areas, meaning as people age quicker, their balance gets worse, their gait speed decreases, their steps in place declines, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's even associated with facial aging, right? This is the really famous picture from the Dunedin Pace study where all of these people are 45 years old chronologically, but they look very, very different, quite literally because this is phenotypic aging, biological aging at its finest, where people who have a faster Dunedin pace are going to look older compared to the average, even compared to the slower um, users as well. So these are all images um, or all real people from the Dunedin cohort. Um, they're just kind of CGI images uh, put together just so you can compare across time groups. Um, so we do know omic MH, Symphony H, and Dunedin pace, they all correlate with these quality of life outcomes, both health span and lifespan, which is great. Uh, point number three, though, the question we want to ask ourselves here is, what has the least variation from test to test? This is basically a gut check, right? It's precision. It tells us how much we can actually trust the result. Um, usually, um, you know, tests are, are also measured by their accuracy, right? Getting to something that's known, but unfortunately the biological aging of, of a person is never gonna be known. So here we're just trying to hit that target over and over and over again, right? We can be uh, very, very precise in these measurements. And, and we should be, we should hold ourselves to that particular standard as well. So how do we actually answer this question? Um, well, this is measured by an intraclass correlation coefficient value, um, basically meaning if we test a sample multiple times, how highly correlated are the results to one another? Um, and you can see here, 
you want an ICC value of at least uh, above 0 0.9 to 1.0, um, this is going to be considered excellent agreement within those two samples. So I'm going to pick on omic image as an example. You can see uh, in these particular replicates, we have an R squared correlation value of above 0 0.99. Um, so this is extremely reliable in terms of testing that same exact sample at the same time. Um, and then the Dunedin pace, for example, you can see it actually outperforms all of the other uh, biological age clocks um, in terms of its ICC value uh, way above 0 0.9. Um, you can even see, again, the first generation clocks, like the Horvath clock here in this example, only has an ICC value of 0 0.4, um, which is super poor. You know, if you're using these first generation clocks in clinical practice, that means it can basically have up to an 18 year variance within the same sample. Um, so we know that's that's one of the issues with these first generation clocks is they can have uh, extreme variance as well. So with ICC value, uh, reliability-based testing, uh, we know the OMIC MH, Symphony H, and the Dunedin PACE are all going to be quite precise, which is great. So let's move on to the fourth point here. Um, the question we really want to ask ourselves is, do these clocks respond well to proven methods? That's really important. Proven methods for aging uh, improvement like caloric restriction, like synolytic-based therapy. So the tools to measure this can be a little bit more difficult to source. We need to look at interventional change, right? This helps us see if it is consistent with data we actually already have. So I'm going to use the famous caloric restriction study. This is the calorie randomized control trial. Um, here you can see the first generation clocks, the Horvath and Hanum. They actually go up with caloric restriction. Um, Dino age and Grimage get a little bit better. Grimage is actually not statistically significant. Unfortunately, um, Dunedin Pace is the only clock that's actually statistically significant as well. So this looks really, really good. Um, I actually just came back even from the Aging uh, Research Drug Discovery Conference, uh, the ARDD in Copenhagen, a couple of months back as well. And I'm telling you, the one real uh, trial they talked about, or at least talked about the most, I would say, is some form of caloric restriction. It does look to be the best, and it's what's the most well-documented from um, a larger population standpoint uh, with these epigenetic biological age clocks. And we see the newer clocks move in that correct direction with caloric restriction. Um, secondarily, I mentioned synolytics, right? So here are... Um, here was our synolytic trial that we did with quercetin and desatinib. Um, and again, you're actually seeing the first generation clocks go up from baseline to time point to time point. Um, so this is an issue. We're actually able to see um, the synolytic therapy decrease within second generation, third generation clocks too. Um, and you can actually see that um, through uh, an additional um, study we did. So with the desatinib and quercetin synolytics, I know this... Um, Heat map can be a little bit confusing here. Again, we actually see in red the first generation clocks. Um, they are moving in the negative direction. Um, and with the green, the second generation, third generation clocks are moving in the positive direction. Um, one thing I'm super excited to hint to you all today um, is a really, really large trial we're doing with Yale. This will actually be published in a couple weeks, um, the preprint at least. Um, we are doing the work to fill in the gap in our understanding of which longevity interventions impact epigenetic biomarkers. This is a huge frustration point within the field, right, um, where uh, you can even see um, in this, this heat map here, we're representing data from over 50 different interventional trials. The final publication will have 75, and we're looking at the effects on more than 100 DNA methylation biomarkers in humans, um, different groups in, in humans as well, both healthy um, and disease-based groups. But there are a lot of gaps in the literature, meaning not all of the clocks were measured. You know, there are newer clocks now. Um, a lot of times these, um, these data sets aren't looked at in depth within each particular clock. So we need to understand how these work um, on a larger level. So the key message being different interventions can affect aging biomarkers in very different ways, right? These are all different tools. And by studying this data, we're able to identify really the most effective treatments for improving biological age across multiple different measurements and what these clocks are actually capturing. Um, you can even see when we narrow the focus a little bit, uh, 50 interventions still, but 15 of the most commonly used DNA methylation biomarkers. Uh, we're looking at things like ART uh, therapy, metformin, hyperbaric oxygen chamber therapy, kidney transplant, um, different pressures within HBOT, different diets, ketamine use as well, um, different supplementation like vitamin B12 and folate, um, umbilical cord blood transfusions, 
What else do we have in here? Um, rapamycin, uh, semaglutide, dexamethasone, et cetera. So um, more to come on this. This is super, super exciting. Um, we're definitely going to be doing an, another webinar uh, just separately on this entire paper once it's published, showing you more about our findings. Um, point being, though, again, second generation uh, biomarkers and third generation are going to be by far the most responsive to interventions. So from a clinical standpoint, we're very confident that we need to be using the second generation and third generation clocks to really track change as it relates to longevity. Um, so we know omega MH, symphony H, Deneen, and PACE, they're all going to respond to interventions, which we know beneficially affect the biology of aging. Um, last but not least, we need to ask the question, do these clocks give us the how or why behind what um, we're aging, right? So the tools here are to look for detailed guidance. Um, now, remember, older clocks typically try to quantify whole body aging and reduce aging to a single score, right, where you may be five years older or three years younger, as you see in this image here. But this is not insightful for a clinician. Um, it could be to some extent, but it's just very, very limited in, in terms of its utility. Um, but we've been able to tell you the why with our omic MH, right? Our approach to integrate multiple layers of aging biology by looking at the lens um, of aging through the idea of the multiome. That's where we actually introduced our epigenetic biomarker proxies and measured many clinical lab values, metabolites, proteins, and a million DNA methylation markers, and are able to actually report out the DNA methylation interpretation of that outcome. And not only that, but we're also able to give you that same resolution with Symphony Age, right? Um, this is the clock we helped uh, create with Yale. So um, we already know, right? Clinical medicine is organized by organ system. There are special specialties in cardiology, neurology, et cetera. Um, so there's a really good reason to focus on individual organ systems. Each one, for example, is defined by functions that are essential for life. The cardiovascular system transports oxygen, nutrients to keep us alive you know, removes waste, can he excretes the waste and regulates the body fluid composition and the immune system fights infection, right? So these systems are highly integrated and organs play roles in multiple systems, but most importantly, these are the essential functions we're trying to preserve in the face of aging, right? Um, so we worked with Dr. Morgan Levine, we worked with Raghav Segal um, and Dr. Albert Higgins Chen to create these individual system specific aging clocks from different biomarker groups. And that gave rise to 11 different specific DNA methylation clocks. Um, so we're able to dive in to each individual clock if we're accelerated and start to understand the biomarkers behind it and what's actually driving it. So yes, we do know from the omic MH, the symphony age, it explains why we're aging. Now the Dunedin pace doesn't do this. Right, that's because of how it was created um, in terms of its third generation uh, longitudinal based clock. But it is still by far what I think is the most useful for N of one precision based medicine because it's been to um, be shown to be the most responsive in such short period of time. So, um, in summary, you know, to impact aging, we need these diagnostics to assess risk and then assess treatment. Um, and we need algorithms that follow all of those five points, right? High hazard ratios, high ICC values, in, um, correlate with lifespan and health span, change with known interventions, and include breakdowns of the aging features. So we actually have three of the clocks that fit that criteria, omic MH, symphony age, and Dunedin pace. So I am going to now turn it over to Melissa. She is going to go through a real life example um, and talk again how you can use these more in the clinic. Um, I really wanted to cover for you all, why do we trust these algorithms? Why do we know they're gonna have extreme clinical utility? Um, now Melissa is gonna take it over and go a little bit farther in depth into them. Oh, Melissa, are you on? Yes, yeah, sorry, Hannah. One technical difficulty, but I got it figured out. Cool, you're good. Take it away. You should be able to use the, the keys. All right. Okay, so my real life example is actually Hannah Wint. Um, so everyone should be pretty familiar with her because she just talked for the last 20 something minutes, maybe 30. Um, and so this is part of Hannah's OMIC image report here. First, I'm starting in her summary report. I'm just going to go through those top three algorithms that Hannah mentioned. So here's her omic image. You can see that when she took this test, she had just turned 27, but her biological age 
showed that she was a little bit older at 27.67 or two thirds of a year older than her actual age. And you can see, you can also see here where Hannah lies when compared to the Harvard Biological Aging Cohort in this scatter plot on the bottom right. She's the yellow dot that's really hard to see. You would love to turn that purple, by the way, Hannah. Um, and you can kind of see where, where she falls among that cohort when she's being compared to other people her same chronological age on the x-axis, technically plus or minus two years, and biological age on the y-axis. So you can see that she's falling pretty close to the line of regression, which is approximately the average. But if you look at her percentile, you can see that she's just a little bit above it at 67th percentile, meaning that of the people tested that are Hannah's same chronological age in the Harvard Biological Aging Cohort, she's older than 67% of them biologically. But more important is looking at longitudinal change, right? So here you can see Hannah has been tested four times in recent history, and you can see her age trajectory here. So aging the most between her first two time points and then going down by a little over a year between time points two and three, and then heading back up just over a year um, from her last time point. So why did Hannah keep getting older? Um, and the important thing about this is that we can see um, you know, a breakdown of what's encouraging her omic image to keep increasing. And so in this case, a, a subset of the 28,000 methylation markers that make up the omic image is comprised of 35 epigenetic biomarker proxies, and those contain clinical factors, metabolites, and proteins. On the summary report, you're gonna see up to eight of those that are outside the normal range, which we call actionable because we're positive at true diagnostic, and in order of their impact on their age. So we'll start with Hannah's number one EVP causing an increase in her age um, of the subset that we're measuring here, which you can see is fasting glucose. So epigenetic biomarker proxies are a little bit different than the traditional value. So Hannah has actually never had a high fasting glucose. So what could this mean? Well, this is usually the story for people who find themselves between 80 and 90% on fasting glucose. They've never seen a high fasting glucose on traditional values, but kind of similar to hemoglobin A1C, we know that if someone like this puts a continuous glucose monitor on their arm, they're very likely to see unexpected spikes in glucose throughout the day, or even prolonged high glucose, maybe from a food choice, maybe they're sipping coffee with milk in it all day, um, maybe some insulin resistance or something similar. But we can also see in Hannah's that she has another marker that's associated with glucose or insulin, which is insulin-like growth factor binding protein two. And oftentimes we see this being associated with insulin resistance or reduced insulin sensitivity in a person, but we also seeing it be higher in people who are really stressed um, or are drinking too much alcohol and, and things like that. Another marker, oh, um, further down Hannah's report, you can also see that she has methylation associated with the ABCG1 gene, which is under our type 2 diabetes risk report. And this actually increases Hannah's lifetime risk of type 2 diabetes by 9%. So maybe insulin resistance is something that Hannah has an increased predisposition to experience in the first place. But also you can see um, that Hannah has elevated N-acetylisoputrinine, which may serve as a marker of altered cellular metabolism, potentially indicating the presence of disorders like chronic inflammation or metabolic imbalances. And we know that taking N-acetylcysteine is something um, that Hannah could do. So adding NAC to her diet might be a good idea. And the last one for her, we can see that her plasmologens are a little bit low. She might need to support her body's mechanism for making these either by cutting out alcohol or increasing omega-3s and antioxidants or even considering a plasmologen supplement. Um, some would also recommend consuming organ meat or organ meat supplements, but there is also some evidence that getting her plasmologens from creatures that make it independently might not serve a person well. So moving on to Hannah's symphony age, you can see that her symphony age is just a little bit better than her omic image, being the same age as her current chronological age. But why is it 27? Um, below that portion of the report, you're going to see the breakdown into the different organ systems. And so here you can see how it was determined. Um, first, you can notice that the green is less than her chronological age, where you can see most of her organ systems fall. Red is going to be more than her chronological age, where you just see one. And then Purple is the same as her age where you can see like her heart and lung age here. So the question obviously is why is Hannah's hormone age so high? Um, and to answer that question, I want to show you how we think about these individual organ systems. So we'll talk about metabolic age first, just because it's an easy one to sort of talk through. You can see it listed here on um, all the biomarkers that we use to train for the algorithm. And this page you can get at the bottom of the symphony age report for any of your clients in the summary report, or, or sorry, just in the symphony age report. So a large cohort was 
was used and then each of these values were calculated basically. So for metabolic age, um, they used a, a big cohort of people and they calculated, you know, how many years have they smoked? Have they ever had diabetes historically? What's their HSCRP, et cetera, et cetera. You can read those faster than I can say them. And then what they did was a principal component analysis kind of on the sum of the total for that. And that principal component is the value that became the age for the metabolic system. And likewise for all of these different systems. And then to, to train an algorithm, we basically took blood from those same individuals, extracted DNA from that blood, and then put it through bisulfite sequencing to, to access the methylation, threw it on a DNA methylation chip to look at 1.2 million sites. And then we used a machine learning algorithm with all that data thrown in at once and asking the question, when a particular site is methylated, how often is it correlated with this outcome? And that's how we chose the sites that would be building this algorithm. So we're predicting the principal component. So what I can't tell Hannah if she had a high metabolic age would be which of these things is causing her issue, except by maybe using this test to sort of answer the question if any of these are outside the normal range, and also knowing a little bit more about other outside sources for her. But for Hannah, metabolic issue wasn't the problem. For Hannah, it's hormone age. And I'm not actually a big fan of hormone age because it only includes IGF-1 and DHEAs. Um, but the reason for this is that even the largest biobanks in the world, um, you know, that we work with to create these clocks don't have hormone panels. Um, so we don't have numbers like testosterone or estradiol. We're really limited in the training in that way. But we still know that it is based off IGF-1 and DHEA. So there's maybe something we could learn about here. And so one thing I was thinking about for Hannah is that if her insulin-like growth factor binding protein two um, was high from her EBP section of her omic image report that we just went over, it's intricately linked with IGF-1 in that, you know, they're both part of this IGF system, um, regulating growth and metabolism and cell survival. And usually if Hannah's IGF BP2 levels are high, it reduces the availability of free IGF-1 because it binds it. So we might expect to see low IGF-1 in Hannah, but guess what? We don't see that. So Hannah's IGF-1 is actually super high. Well, it turns out that when a person is experiencing insulin resistance, both igf bp 2 and IGF-1 levels might both rise. And so those being, you know, igf bp 2 being high is often elevated in people with obesity or type 2 diabetes, potentially reflecting some metabolic stress and attempts to modulate IGF-1's anabolic effects. Um, so this, you know, chronic inflammation or maybe insulin resistance or something could be raising both of these for Hannah. Oh, and you can also notice that her DHEAs look normal. So that's probably not the reason that she's going up. And here you can also see um, Hannah's symphony age change over time and where she falls relative to the true diagnostic cohort in the scatter plot on the left, where you can see again, chronological age on the x-axis, symphony age on the y-axis. And you can see she's falling approximately around the, you know, the line of regression and putting her in the 52nd percentile. And then to the right, you can see her longitudinal change there. So we'll move on to her and pace and then we'll put it together. So moving now to Janina Pace, um, which really translate DNA methylation data into a metric where a value of one represents the biological equivalent of one year of aging per calendar or chronological year. Um, values greater than one suggest that a person's aging more quickly, while values less than one indicate slower aging. Our scale reports your value between 0 0.6 and 1.4, which is where all the members of the Danina Pace study fell, but we have outliers in our system. I think our lowest is still 0 0.48, and the highest I've ever had on a call was 1.53. Um, but this is going to be capturing how you've been doing over the last two to three months. So you should expect fluctuations based off of physiological changes like illness or injury, surgery, eating poorly, um, lacking exercise, not sleeping well, this sort of thing. But also practicing wellness, however that looks for an individual, is also going to reduce the Danina pace. And now I'm going to show you Hannah's Danina pace um, over time and where she falls compared to her cohort, where you can see she's in a higher percentile. I don't think I quite um, pasted that on here. Um, but what I do have on here is her longitudinal tracking, and I want to go through that together. So here's where Hannah started out just before October 2023, right as we were about to launch Omic Image. I wasn't actually with the company at the time, but I know all the dates. Um, and this was True Diagnostics' first second generation clock. And um, you can imagine that launching that clock could be pretty stressful. But during this time, um, you know, True Diagnostic also grew in a really big way. Hannah's calendar looks wild. She's got calls back to back every single day. And I'm sure it was even worse before I came along. 
Um, and the Omega Mage also put Hannah in a lot of new social situations, traveling to conferences and meetings and courses, as well as hosting some herself and communicating with the team at True Diagnostic and every provider outside of that, organizing webinars like this one, um, and also drinking more at all these different gatherings, flying on, you know, red eye flights. Um, and, and also, you know, when she did get a chance to hang out with her friends, you can see her picture here where I captured a high noon in her hand and I was drinking then too. Um, but then she also got super sick with COVID, probably the sickest that she's ever been. So this might be the reason for Hannah's massive increase to 1.42 on Danine and Pace. But then shortly thereafter, um, Hannah was living her best life in the Malfi Coast and um, looking stunning. And she recovered from COVID and she got to turn off her um, emails. So this is like a really nice move in the right direction for Hannah. And her Danine and Pace dropped down to 0.83. Um, following that, we launched the Symphony Age report, which was a really stressful time for both of us. Our calendars were both stacked and we were trying to go through all the issues with development to make sure everything was perfect for, for all of our favorite providers. So how do the other clocks compare to the Danina Pace we'll start with first? First, you can see it really aligns with the Romic image, where you see this increase in her age at the beginning is really consistent with that big increase in her Danina Pace, followed by a drop in her age, which had a drop in Danina Pace as well. And you know the pace has a bigger drop than what we what we can appreciate from the omic image, but the omic image is really going to capture historical aging, whereas Danina pace is going to be changing with even you know rapid change in the short term. And then lastly, you can see that you know Hannah's age goes up just a little bit at the end, and likewise her Danina pace is also going up just a little bit. But if you look in other places in her report, and we're not really covering this topic, but I wanted to show these anyway, um, you'll also see that. Hannah had strange fluctuations in her telomere length that's consistent with these same outcomes where you can see this increase um, in Danine and Pace was consistent with um, a reduction in her telomere length and an increase in her omic image. Uh, likewise, when she got kind of back to her baseline um, in Danine and Pace, you see her telomere length went back up to normal. Maybe this is a situation where, you know, Hannah had more senescent cells during this time, maybe from being sick and that sort of thing. It could be stress. There's a ton of things that impact telomere length that could have caused the change in her fluctuations. And then also you can see that the predicted value for C-reactive protein using DNA methylation from our test shows that Hannah had this other big jump um, going up from, from being pretty low to pretty high and then coming back down and then yeah, kind of leveling out again. Um, but I also want to mention that our CRP is a little bit different than your standard um, high sensitivity CRP in that it's um, it's more stable than HSCRP. It also trends with age going up over time. And unlike HSCRP, it's been correlated with cognitive function and brain health outcomes. The two biggest reasons that you'll see CRP having a big jump like this is because a person has a lot of stress or they're drinking or both. Um, so you can see how these sort of all correlate pretty well with each other. But then hold up a second, what about symphony age? Um, how does this really fit this picture? So let's talk about it. First, if we're gonna compare the two biological age clocks here, you can see that between Hannah's second and third points, both of these, you can appreciate a reduction in Hannah's predicted biological ages. Likewise, between her third and fourth time points, you can also appreciate an increase in age for both clocks. So that begs the question, like why did Hannah's first time point with symphony age start out so high? and then go down, but then omic image started out super low and went up. And it's because these clocks are telling us different things. So first, um, you know, what made Hannah's symphony age go down, but wasn't enough to impact omic image in the same way. So now I wanna take a look at the breakdown of the time points um, for each of the organ systems in symphony age. So musculoskeletal age for Hannah dropped significantly from her first to second time point. So I, you know, I wanted to know what the heck were you doing Hannah? And I found out she was, um, you know, lifting weights. There she is in the gym. She did some orange theory and she threw a treadmill under her desk. Maybe we all need to take a note from Hannah on this one. But was it just musculoskeletal? No, it wasn't. So Hannah's heart age, predictably, also benefited from these new hobbies. But lastly, you can see that Hannah's hormone age actually has also come down significantly from where it used to be. So you probably thought her hormone age was bad now. It was actually way worse before. Um, and also, basically every other system was higher to begin with. So Hannah's organ systems may not have been operating at their peak performance when she first tested, but through some lifestyle change, Hannah was able to see a drop in the biological age prediction related to those. So um, these clocks are also telling us different things. The second point on this is that the more data, the better. So one thing about data points is that 
you can have a baseline, but it doesn't really mean so much. Having two, two data points is actual data, right? So the baseline doesn't mean much if we can't appreciate the change. So being able to capture um, longitudinal change for a, a client is the goal. Um, and so by, by being able to see Hannah's time points at multiple times, we can sort of predict what could be making these changes and come up with this story that sort of elucidates why Hannah's age has changed in the way it has. The third point is the more data, the, data, the better. Again, this time what I mean by more data is um, using different clocks, we can learn different things about an individual, helping to add to this comprehensive picture. So from omic image, we might've learned some things about Hannah. Maybe she's experiencing some insulin resistance or stress. Um, she could you know, throw a CGM on her arm and see what her glucose is looking like. She could also add an AC and see if that brings down her age at all. And she also might need to think about how to support her plasmalogen health. Um, but from her symphony age report, we realized that maybe she needs to focus on IGF-1 and I think her, her labs would also support that. Um, I don't think she needs to do anything about DHEAs after seeing her lab results, but I just added that last minute. <laughs> but she can also check other organ system trends for those that haven't been improving, and she can make changes that way as well. Um, lastly, with the dinging and pace, Hannah might need to focus on reducing stress and maybe take another vacation. It seems like it did a lot of good for her. Um, so that idea of like stress for her could be causing some of these sort of issues that she seems to have with insulin resistance, but you can see how all three of these clocks together plus some of the additional values from other parts of Hannah's report really helped us learn what's contributing to Hannah's age overall. Um, and that's you know, gonna help us keep Hannah looking young and more like this baby face on the left and less like this older age generated face on the right. And so in summary on this one, I, we wanna say um, the best parts about these clocks is that they bring something different to the table. Um, the first one being omic image and that we think this is the best one for thinking about um, why you're aging on a multi-omic level. And also, uh, you know, it's the best for predicting death as well. Symphony age is the best for resolution when you're thinking about how your organ systems are functioning and like why you're aging and your disease prediction, as well as um, Deneen and Pace here are being the best for thinking about short-term changes. This is how you can see if interventions that you're doing are working in the short term before all those other methylation markers are gonna move over time. Each of these are trained and validated differently, and that makes them all unique. And that's why we like throwing them all together. We think that putting these three clocks together in addition to some of the other points in the, in the report is the best way to get the most out of your biological age testing. And with that, I think um, I'll turn it back over to Hannah um, if she wants to take any of these questions. Cool, thanks, Melissa. Um, that was fun. Um, Awesome. We have, um, three open questions right now. Um, Dr. Ali, it's nice to see you on. Um, he mentioned omic MH, um, and the symphony age seemed to have different results. A patient can have younger organs for all organs and then, um, be older than their chronological age from so omic. So basically I think he's saying, Hey, omic can tell one story. Symphony H can tell another. How can both be explained uh, scientifically to the patient? Um, I'm going to say we answered that live. Hopefully Melissa just answered that for you. Let me know if you have uh, any follow-up there. Um, Dr. Camillo, nice to see you on as well. You mentioned, um, can we please share the Cornell reference? Yes. I will try and look that up right now and share the link or I'll, I'll email you separately. Um, anonymous attendee, um, Hannah, do you guys use elastic net, uh, DNA methylation, looking at methylation of cytosines as the basis for your clock? Um, so we do, I, I, it depends, um, definitely on the particular algorithm interpretation. Melissa, um, actually is, a um, Jack of all trades. She, uh, actually taught bioinformatics at Johns Hopkins and does a little bit of work with our team as well. And in, in that realm, Melissa, do you want to add anything else to that answer? Um, just that we're actually developing some clocks right now that don't use elastic net regression models. So, um, I think that's going to be exciting. We're coming out with the report that Hannah alluded to, and they'll be using a completely different method. And I can't wait to sort of discuss that with everybody in a, in a broader, sort of context so that you can see how amazing these other methods are for, for these new aging clocks. Awesome. So hopefully that answered your question there. Um, 
Dr. Camillo, I am popping this link in here for the neurosyphilis research. I just sent that to you in the answer if you want to pull that out. Um, and it looks like we answered that one live. Any other questions before we hop off here? Oh, I see one more. Um, Isan, nice to see you. Are there any plans to include journaling, actual blood work, such as CRP and functional tests in the model? So um, yeah, all of those are essentially um, included in the model already. So um, I'm not sure if you're asking us if we're going to actually be reporting on like traditional blood work, CRP, et cetera, but we use um, traditional blood work, metabolomic profile, proteomic profile to actually um, power the omic image um, and, you know, a lot of those same biomarkers to actually power um, the uh, symphony age as well. So I may have interpreted that incorrectly, um, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, Thank you guys. Love the Hannah walkthrough. Take a vacation, Hannah. I know. Um, ask my boss. That would be nice. Um, oh, Dr. Yerth. Hey, Dr. Yerth. What's up? Anonymous. <laughs> I hope you're doing well. Nice to see you. Um, Davina, most of my clients are coming back with two organ systems older than their age, hormones and lungs. Any idea why this may be? Um, Davina, that's so funny you said that. Um, that's actually mine too. So my hormones is um are pretty old. And then actually, if you look at my lungs, um, you'll see that 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 one is quite elevated on me as well. Melissa, um, anything to add about that? Lungs and hormones. Yeah. So I want to talk about the hormones for a second. It's my least favorite clock. Um, and I'm not shy about saying that. What I see, the really common trend that I see is that females on HRT have horrible hormone ages. Um, it's not exactly clear why that is. I'm sure that I could like guess um, in an educated fashion, but I'm not going to because I don't want to tell you incorrect data. Um, but males on HRT um, have the opposite and their hormone ages look amazing. Um, so if you're noticing it on people who are taking HRT, that's definitely why. Otherwise, think about testing their DHEAs and their IGF-1, like that might be the reason. Um, but I do think that other things could be influencing this that are not totally clear. Um, as far as lung age goes, I've also been seeing this trend lately too. And I've actually been running an analysis um, with a couple of the people from Bioinformatics Group to see what could be going on. Some of the theories we have are about, you know, upper respiratory infections like COVID, obviously that could be causing these issues in the short term. But we're also thinking about um, you know, for a lot of clients, these are people who, um, even though they never smoked or they maybe never um, can think of like secondhand smoking from, you know, their household or something like that. One thing we know is that even in the 90s, you know, people are allowed to smoke indoors in most facilities and some people even today do that. So maybe if a person historically was exposed to smoke in that way, oftentimes you can tell though, if it's smoking related, because you'll see that their metabolic age is a little bit elevated as well. Maybe not like in the red but that's gonna affect metabolic age as well. So that's something to think about when you're seeing the higher lung age. But also I wanna point out that these organ, individual organ systems, they're going to fluctuate a little bit more than you're gonna notice like biological age clocks. So you might see um, like Hannah's lung age dropped like by seven years over a six month time point. So I just wanna like point that out, that, that that's something that happens as well. Perfect. Thanks, Melissa. Um, Janet, nice to see you on. You just asked a question about intermittent, um, or excuse me, fasting mimicking diet. Um, no data on that quite yet. We're trying to do a study with Prolon uh, right now, actually. Um, but there is a study um, that I just sent you, uh, the Tyrol Gassoon study, um, looking at uh, actually the intermittent fasting. I think it'll be the first ever published um, on that. And it's been going on, I believe for over a decade or, or two now, um, looking at the epigenetic biological age clocks. Um, and they're getting some really good data again, depending on, um, kind of the type, the, the window, et cetera. Um, and then I just have Camillo in here saying some really nice things. Congratulations, Hannah, you and your team, you look perfect, fantastic. Uh, so I don't know how we could possibly improve your biological age clock. Well, we'll keep improving. We, we need to for, for the field. Um, you mentioned, uh, this will be the last question here. Um, we've developed a method to turn D differentiated cells, um, let's see, into much younger cells that produce insulin again. How can we access biological age in cell samples? Um, there are actually some single cell profiled um, based clocks. Um, 
I'm not sure in terms of how predictive they are of, you know, all cause mortality morbidity. They, they aren't, I would say validated, um, as heavily as these, um, kind of second generation, third generation base clocks. Um, you're mentioning, we know they look younger, meaning they differentiated again, producing insulin like when they were decades younger, but is there a way to assess their biological age to demonstrate that they actually reverse the biological age at the time they restore differentiation of specialized tissues? Um, Single cell, you should probably look at, um, oh gosh, his name, the name of the company is escaping right, me, right now. Um, Alex Trapp, um, he um, has published on single cell epigenetic profiling, um, and he is actually um, at Retro Biosciences um, out of the Bay Area. So I'd recommend looking into um, him. I don't know if you have anything else to- Can I um, jump in on that too, Hannah? I just want to yeah, say- go that ahead. I don't think single cell is exactly what um, they're looking for. I'm, I think more so, um, you know, extracting DNA from the cells, like the cells as a whole. I think that's um, what they mean. And um, if that's true, then um, you could technically just extract DNA from those samples, put it through bisulfite sequencing and throw it on a chip the same way we do with the blood. Um, even though mm. it's too specific or, or, um, de-differentiated cells, I think it would be a really cool trial. I'd love to see it. Um, and I'd be happy to look at that data too. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, come on, I'll send you that as well. So, um, I want to be appreciative of everyone's time. Thank you all so much. If you have any other questions, you can reach uh, Melissa and I. It's just our, our first name at truediagnostic.com. Um, we have our healthcare provider um, support email now available too. It's just providers, uh, plural, at truediagnostic.com. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. We'll get this recording out to you soon. Bye-bye.